Yeah, then we will move on to our next speaker, uh, that is invited speaker, Dr. Guirong Wang from Chinese Academy of Agriculture Science. So now I hand it over to Guirong. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, wait. Thanks for your introduction. And then let me share the PPT first. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gui Rong Wang from the Institute of Plant Protection, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. Today, I'm going to talk about molecular mechanism of factory coating in Halicopa Majora and its application. Okay. Uh, olfaction, the sense of smell, is a critical modality of insect. Olfaction plays a predominant role in mediating insect behavior, including courtship, host seeking, escape from natural enemies, and then uh, unfriendly environment, and so on. According to this feature, we could develop insect behavior regulators, <clears throat> including mating disrupting, disruption, attraction, attractant, and also repellent. To develop insect behavior regulators, the critical point is how to obtain the compounds with high activity to insect behavior. These compounds significantly attract or repel pest insects. The traditional method for screening behavior regulators need to carry out behavior assays using a live insect. This method consumes both manpower and material resources. With an in-depth study of molecular biology and functional genomics in agricultural pest insects, we could perform high throughput screening of active compounds using olfactory gene as targets. Before that, we need to elucidate the molecular mechanism of olfactory encoding and establish the relationship between uh, olfactory genes and insect behavior. This is the current molecular view of insect olfaction. Antenna on the head is a major olfaction organ. On the surface of antenna houses several different kinds of sensilla. A sensillum is a small sensory hair structure, and here olfactory receptor neuron send their dendrites into lymph, and then olfactory signal transduction events are taking place here. In insects, it's a general thought that the order recognition is mediated by the conserved OCO along with one conventional OR. These OR likely form like in the gate ion channel that activated the effect receptor neuron. Obviously, order and the receptors are the core of peripheral olfactory coding insect. Recently, our study focused on olfactory coding in cotton bollworm, Helicopa Midra, because this insect is a notorious agricultural pest worldwide. And then cotton bollworm also feed on more than 200 crops, such as cotton, corn, wheat, and so on. Besides, cotton bollworm and its closely related species is, uh, are regarded as an excellent model for studying insect uh, olfaction. Two main sex pheromone components and in several manners have been identified and then uh, sex prep uh, have been developed. Beyond this, several labs developed food attractants based on active host plant volatiles. However, this efficiency of this kind of products need to be improved. In order to mass screen active compounds, Target important organ receptors in cotton bollworm. We need to reconstruct the order and receptors uh, function in vitro, and also need to clarify their relationship with cotton bollworm's behavior in vivo. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, recent progress on the molecular basis of cell communication and also host thinking in cotton bollworm. The first part is. Um, Cell communication in Helicopa Majora. Uh, during the last few decades, several 
uh, several fatty acid uh, derivatives have been identified from the sex pheromone gland of cotton bovine. Of these compounds, CIS11 hexadecimal and then CIS9 hexadecimal are regarded as major functional components. Uh, plenty of researchers about uh, researchers about the peripheral mechanism of uh, sex pheromone encoding in cotton boa have been published. But here, I would like to show some recent advances. Sensilla trichoida account for more than half of all the sensilla uh, that's thought to be tuned to sex pheromone in, in male uh, of cotton boa. In order to identify and clarify different function types of sensilla trichoida, we recorded more than 1,000 sensilla trichoida from 100 males using single sensilla recording technique. The sensilla trichoida in male antenna divided, divided into three types, and each sensilla houses two neurons. And we next ask, which receptor express each neurons? We identified, we identified 65 other receptor genes, including seven candidate pheromone receptors uh, through bioinformatic analysis uh, of transcriptome and genome sequence. And uh, next, we uh, use Xenopus oversights to dehumanize all the pheromone receptors uh, the ligands of four pheromone receptors are identified. Combined with uh, single sense recording results, we construct a receptor to neural map. The male sense trichoida divided into three types, and each sense cell houses two neurons. Each neuron expressed one receptor. However, the in vitro function of pheromone receptor didn't match well with the function of neuron from the uh, single sense film recording. Uh, the, the corresponding receptor of cis 9 tetradecimal and cis 9 uh, uh, hexadecimal is still unknown. And we still don't know the molecular basis of cis 9 tetradecimal recognition in cotton bowl. Uh, since uh, the low concentration of this kind of compounds act as agonists, but high concentration act as uh, antagonists. In order to address about the questions, we generated a pheromone receptor knockout strain using CRISPR-Cas9 technique. To test which pheromone receptor is responsible for the perception of cis 9 hexadecimal, we performed the behavior assay in wind tunnel to compare wild type and mutant. We can see that our six mutant had no any effect on male behavior including flight, upwind, close, and landing. However, our 14 or 14 bead mutant disrupted the close and landing behavior to sex pheromone mixture. The results significantly indicate that our 14 B, but not our 6, is a critical receptor for recognition of cis 9 uh, hexadecimal. To test which types of sensilum or 14B located, or 14B expressed. Single sensor recording was performed. There are 16 adjacent neurons show the impaired electrophysiological response to both cis 9 hexanol and cis 9 tetradecimal. That means or 14B and or 16 expressed in the same sensor. And the behavior assays in wind tunnel uh, has performed, that result showed that cis 9 tetradecimal could replace cis 9 hexadecimal, uh, especially for the low, uh, the low concentration of cis 9 tetradecimal, even more attractive to males than cis 9 hexadecimal. And our six mutant males also show strong attractive behavior to cis 11 hexadecimal and the low concentration of cis 9 tetradecimal. Uh, just uh, like wild type. That means OR6 was not essential for the attractive behavior of male to low concentration of cis 9 tetradecimal. OR14B neuron is also more sensitive to cis 9 tetradecimal than to cis 9 hexadecimal. 
that explain the why cis9 tetradecimal with low concentration could replace the cis9 hexadecimal. A briefly summary, uh, or 14 b bundled or 6 is a critical receptor for perception of cis9 hexadecimal and cis9 tetradecimal with low concentration. And the activity of or 16 neuron can be influenced by the adjacent neuron. Combined with previous study, we draw conclusion, cis9 tetradecimal uh, in the low concentration act as agonist uh, in blind blend through activating or 14 b However, high concentration act as antagonist through activating or 16 The second part is the molecular basis of a host plant volatiles detection in helicopter measure. So far, sex attractants have been widely used for passive insect monitoring and control. However, sex attractant only attract male, not works for female. Male morse is capable of multiple mating that significantly weaken the control efficiency. Uh, agriculture pest insects have evolved a powerful ability to find the host plant through perceiving specific plant volatiles. Uh, attractant designed from host plant volatiles can attract both male and female. That might significantly reduce the offspring and improve the control efficiency. So far, several labs developed plant volatile based food attractant. This is Australian researchers developed uh, the attractant called the magnet. Magnet has these chemicals, including uh, phenylacetyl tetrahyde, abbreviated as PAA. And this is um, another uh, attractant, food attractant developed by the University of Greenwich, which also contains PAA, this compound. And this is um, uh, the food attractant developed by our institute. Uh, this is uh, widely used in the field. We can see all the food attractant available so far contains the PA compounds. It, see, it seems PA is dispensable in the food attractant. And this food attractant also attract other nocturnal moths in the field. So I want to address two questions. First is which other receptors involved in perception of food attractant in most, especially for the PAA. Whether PAA receptor conserved among bacteria or even Lactobacteria species. Previous uh, bioinformatic analysis identified 60, 63 other receptors expressed in the antenna, including OCO and seven pheromone receptors the remaining 55 adult OR were presumable, presumed to detect plant volatiles. We cloned 44 general order in the receptors and heterologous expressed in the, in the Xenopus oversights one by one for functional study. Each OR expressed oversights was challenged with a panel of 67 ecologically relevant plant volatiles. Now, finally, 25, 28 other receptors were found to be responsive to at least one odorance we, we test. The strongest response we detected was that OR42 tuned to the aromatic compound PAA. Further, we did functional analysis, cluster analysis of the 28 functional OR and found their functions are highly differentiated with no apparent overlap in their tuning spectrum. We found that most of OR are narrowly tuned to one compound or several one, but the, their structure were similar. And then we conducted those response analysis and found uh, how OR repertoire was very efficient, especially in uh, toponid detection. Many of these toponids have been proposed to be defensive chemicals of plant. For instance, the first one, uh, the most sensitive response uh, obtained for the monotopony narrow leader 
activating or transit. Narrow leader is one of the major herbo-induced compounds in host plant. And we then perform the principal component analysis. We can see the ordinary receptor uh, repertoire have powerful ability to sensing topony and aromaticals. The oral repertoire shows the strongest response to PAA, a critical floral volatile compound. In recent years, a large number of other receptor sequences have been identified in many Lepidopter species, and the function of some other and other receptor have been clarified. The abundant function data generated in our study allow us to re-examine the evolution of Lepidopter or according to their sensing functions by comparing the major ligands of OR from reported species we found a high degree of functional differentiation that is consistent with the rapid expansion of OR within insects. We conduct a deeper comparison of the whole response spectrum between amygdala and literalis. Because my colleague has already euphonized a lot of the other receptor in the uh, literal, literalist. So we identified 15 pairs of the ocelog OR that have been functionally characterized in the two species. We compared the response spectrum of these OR pairs, and that revealed a large, a large degree of functional differentiation. 12 of 15 pairs presented a different response spectral, uh, even they share very high uh, identity of the sequence. Uh, interestingly, we also found three pairs of ocelog OR show the identity response spectral. Among these three pairs, the most highly conserved pair consistent of uh, OR42 and then slit OR15 uh, OR14. Both of them respond to the same ligand, uh, PAA. And then the, it's very high specificity and sensitivity. In the phylogenic tree, they define a unique clade with one or copy from all species. And they especially short branch, short branch length indicated relate to small genetic distance between each clade members. We therefore conduct a selection pressure analysis on each clade, which suggests all OR clade, including the OR42 and the OCO clade, have involved under strong purifying selection. In view of this strong selection pressure and of the conserved functions in cotton bowworm and uh, subadapter literalis, we hypothesized the labdopteral or 42 ocelog likely function in flower sensing. To test our hypothesis about the labdopteral or 42 ocelog as a major flower sensing receptor, we first search for candidates or 42 homolog from the species available, uh, totally including 31 species, uh, including 30. Of the, of the 31 species, including 30 labdoptera and one trichoptera by constructing a new phylogeny. The non dietrocyon moss, Arachocrania, which belong to the basal lineage of the Glosta suborder, we found only one or 42 ocelog in each species. These results supported the ancestor ocelog of OR42 involved from non dietriosome species as the base of the Gloucester lineage. The OR42 ocelog have retained a conserved possible PA sensing function across Gloucester species. So we'll continue perform the, uh, the ocelog function in vitro in the dinosaur oversights. 
uh, we cloned the, or also like from the 11 Lepidopter species, all of the, or 40, 42 Ocelog exhibited a similar response profile, each robust tuned to PAA as its best ligand. Collectively, these results strongly suggest the function or 42 Ocelog for sensing PAA is conserved across uh, moths and butterflies. We further investigated whether the OR are essential in previous behavior to PAA in vivo in the cotton bowl. We conducted mm -hmm. lots of function studies by generating uh, OR42 lacking uh, cotton bowl strain for CRISPR-Cas9. We can see the EAG response of 42 knockout mutant to PAA was significantly decreased in both male and female. And then our 42 expressed neuron are highly sensitive to PAA. The corresponding neuron in 42 mutant lost their activity to PAA. Importantly, the behavior assay, we found that both of male and female mutant lost their preference to the floral attractant uh, a blend, attractant, the, the food attractant blend compared with the wild type. The PA also significantly attracted larvae. Uh, when mutant larvae lost uh, their preference to PA, so the OR42 plays an essential role in detecting important host plant uh, kills PA in both larvae and the adult stage of cotton bollworm. Furthermore, we found our 42 or, or factory sensory neuron convert to a specific glomerular in the antenna loop and a tiny dose of PAA strongly activates the specific glomerular. And our study how to develop efficient attractants based on factory recognition mechanism. I think at first the PAA receptor provided a potential target for screening active compounds for behavior regulation. And then with screening an analog of PAA, it's more stable and also can activate the R42. We're testing these compounds in the field at the moment. And uh, uh, secondly, we can optimize existing attractants. For example, the cotton bowl order and receptor repertoire is very efficient to detect uh, trans to hexano 10 If you add this compound uh, into existing attractant, that is significantly improve the attractant efficiency in the field. Um, okay, and then here, I uh, would like to thank my students, uh, Guo Mengbo, Du Li Xiao, and my colleague, Liu Yang, and also my collaborator, Dr. Amnio, Jack and Jolie. Uh, finally, I, I would like to thank for the meeting organizer. And thank you for providing such good opportunity to present our uh, progress, especially uh, in, the, uh, in this difficult time. We couldn't have opportunity, uh, have a chance to communicate each other face to face. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Guirong. Yeah, that's wonderful work. Yeah, you did so much work on the Lepidopter odontoreceptors. So let's see any questions from our attendants. Okay, I already saw a question. Uh, Nobuka, can you ask your question? Um, do you have any idea why most of uh, olfactory receptors are not really tuned in your species? Is it because of experiment, experimental condition, you think? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it ah. for a second. Do you have any idea why most of all factory receptors are narrowly tuned? You mean the, uh, most of the receptors not not conserved? Um, narrowly uh, tuned. Yeah. Narrowly. Narrow, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe... Uh, Maybe because, uh, firstly, we just uh, test some uh, limited uh, compound. And then, 
the second in in the in the cotton bomb is it, uh, yeah it's different with uh, others like in Drosophila and then mosquitoes. I, I don't know, but maybe because of the we test the limited compound. But most of uh, the, the narrowly tuned, especially if you use the lower concentration. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Mm. Uh, we also have a question from Professor Richard Newcomb from New Zealand. So the question is, hi, Guirong, an impressive amount of work. You show convincingly that your most odent receptors are actually quite specific for VOCs. Do you think, therefore, that it is likely that com combina combinatorial Coding is not so important in most, perhaps more labeled, uh, labeled lines. I think uh, uh, for some very important, for some very important behavior, I think maybe they use the uh, label lines. Uh, for example, for the sex pheromone recognition, and also. For the PAA, I think yes, that is following the label line. But for some other uh, orderings from the plant water tires, maybe they still use the combina combinatorial uh, uh, combinatorial coding. So there, there, there is a lot of the examples in insect. The very, very important the behavior they usually use the, the label lines. Jason uh, also have a question. Jason, can you ask? Yeah, certainly. Hi, Guirong. It's nice to see you. Hey, Jason. Nice to see you. <laughs> Guirong, since OR42 is so well conserved across Lepidoptera, and it seems to retain this uh, response, this narrowly tuned response to PAA, do you think that this compound or structural analogs that you're analyzing now will be useful for trapping other moth Pest species as well. Yes, yes, and then so far the uh, food attractant with the PAA can attract a different kind of moths. Not only the cotton bowl, uh, especially for the uh, uh, we we use this product in the field. Uh, we we can attract more than I think five to ten kind of moths we found. So this is uh, our point. If we Use this receptor as target, and then uh, we develop the uh, products that can attract can attract different kind of moths because most of moths they are is the agriculture pets. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, so just a uh, remind everyone, if you have any questions, could you use chat or Q&A? Because if you raise the hand, there are too many people, we couldn't see who raised the hand. So thank you. So um, I have a question, maybe I missed in your presentation. Uh, for Lepidopter insect, any Lepidopter insect, they don't have this OR42 receptor? Yeah, uh, we tested, uh, we searched the 30 Labdoptera, but uh, three of them, we didn't find this is one. Maybe because the sequence is not, not good enough. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And beside the Lepidoptera, you didn't find any insect have the OR42A, 42, yeah. Oh. No, actually, at least uh, there we didn't find a very high identity receptor. Okay. But maybe other receptor can can tune it to can respond to the PA. That's possible. So, any question from our audience? Oh, yeah, we received another question from. Teru UK. So could you directly ask Teru UK? Hi, nice, nice meeting you, Guirong. That was a very mm -hmm. impressive talk. I'm wondering, you said the OR42A is very, very conserved across uh, Lepidoptera. 
So is it possible that like some of the beautiful butterflies such as the swallow tails could be attracted to, accidentally attracted to that, like for example, the phenicillin acet acetaldehyde? Yeah, yes, that's a very good question, especially for the products. And uh, the PA is a major component to develop the uh, attractant, uh, food attractant. Uh, but uh, uh, only one compound that is not good enough. We, we need to add other compounds. Uh, if the combination of the compounds, that is uh, the lab doctor have a different uh, behavior, especially we would like to develop the food uh, attractant to attract the uh, uh, nocturnal moss because most of the nocturnal moss is um, uh, agriculture pets. But for the butterfly, I, I think we can add other compounds. You know, uh, the butterfly maybe don't don't like it, repair the butterfly. Hmm. That's good to know. Thank you. Any more question from audience? If no more questions, then we keep moving on. Uh, thank you, Guirong. Thank you, Wei. So, yeah, and our next speaker is um, Catherine Shaw uh, from University of Tasmania and the Monash University in Australia. So, Catherine? Yep. Great, um, so good afternoon from Hobart. So as I'm sure we're all aware, um, insects need to be able to detect in odorants from their environment to build a picture of what's in the environment around them in order to respond accordingly to hazards and to ensure their survival and propagation. And so one of the way uh, insects do this peripherally is through the olfactor receptor neurons. Um, so in general, um, the responses of most olfactory receptor neurons are highly conserved across closely related Drosophila species. Um, you can see two examples here, the PB1A neuron and the AB1A neuron. However, this isn't the case for the AB3A neuron. Here you can see even between Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila simulans, there's quite a lot of differentiation even amongst this small pool of odorants. It should therefore come as no surprise that the AB3A neuron has been heavily implicated in playing a major role in host specialization. So for Drosophila sichelia being specialized on the Morinda fruit and Drosophila erecta and Drosophila melanogaster being seasonally specialized on the pandanus and marilla fruit respectively. Now in Drosophila melanogaster, the um, odorant receptor locus that controls AB3A response is the OR22 locus. In the laboratory stock Canton S, there are two genes at this locus, OR22A and OR22B. When both genes are present, um, AB3A responds normally to its odorants. However, when both of these genes are absent, there is no AB3A response. When either gene is present independently, um, when we have no OR22A and only OR22B, there is no AB3A response. However, when we have only OR22A, we have a normal AB3A response. And this has led to the conclusion that OR22A alone determines AB3A response. Now, this locus is also of interest because it's been found that it may potentially show uh, a clinal differentiation between the north and the south of Australia. So just a reminder for our friends from the Northern Hemisphere, in Australia, uh, up in the north, it's actually tropical and warm, and down in the south, it's temperate and cool. Um, so for this locus, there is a 100% frequency of one allele down in the south, and about a 70% frequency of a second allele up in the north. These alleles are in the south, the long allele with both OR22A and OR22B present. And in the north, a short allele. Now this short allele is a chimeric um, allele formed from a deletion between the first intron of OR22A and the first intron of OR22B that forms this chimeric receptor consisting of the first exon of 22A and the remaining exons of 22B. And this has been called OR22AB. So we wanted to investigate whether or not 
um, there were changes associated with this allelic differentiation that could potentially drive um, this spread of alleles along the Australian coast. So we start here with the AB3A response we recorded using single unit recording from Canton S flies to our quite large set of odorants. These are predominantly esters and alcohols um, chosen because they are fruit, at fruit odorants and also because that is predominantly what the AB3A neuron responds to. And just a reminder that in this stock, it's been shown that OR22A alone determines AB3 response and OR22B is presumed to be non-functional. So to test whether there was changes in AB3A function um, associated with these differential alleles, we made a number of homozygous lines uh, from populations collected from around Australia. Now, the majority of these lines um, from both the south and one from the north of Australia showed a very similar phenotype to our Canton S phenotype. We call this the AB3A1 phenotype and it will be color coded in blue. Two lines from northern populations showed this divergent phenotype. We call this the AB3A2 phenotype and it will be color coded in orange. Uh, it has some um, differences from the AB3, normal, the sort of standard AB3A response, such as decreased ethylhexanoate response and increased propyl acetate response, but it does have some responses remaining the same, at least at this concentration, such as the ethylbutanoate response. So we consider this a change in function rather than an increase or a decrease in function. We actually found a third phenotype as well from a northern population. We call this the AB3A3 phenotype and it's color coded in red. It shows some of the same changes that we see in the AB3A2 phenotype, such as uh, the decreased ethylhexanoate and increased propyl acetate response. But it shows some differences as well, such as this decreased pentyl acetate and increased ethylpropanate response. Now, if we look at the genetics here, what we found is that for the lines that have this phenotype, they have the deletion, um, the chimeric receptor OR22AB. Now, there are several identified um, non-synonymous SNPs in this gene as well when compared to the sequences from Canton S. But actually in this third phenotype, we have both OR22A and OR22B present. Um, each gene has two non-synonymous SNPs. So we'll be referring to the genes from the AB3A1 phenotype as OR22A1 and OR22B1 and the genes from the AB3A3 phenotype as OR22A3 and OR22B3. Now, when we look at these in a little bit more depth, uh, we chose three what we'd consider kind of key odorants that we'd identified throughout our um, odorant screening. Um, we consider these sort of the key odorants because, well, ethylhexanoate is pretty well known to be an important odorant for AB3A1 neurons. And then the, these other two were sort of the highest responding odorants from the panel that we tested. And you can see here that we see vastly different sensitivities to these odorants from our three phenotypes, with um, the AB3A1 neurons being highly sensitive to ethylhexanoate, AB3A2 neurons being highly sensitive to isopentyl acetate, and AB3A3 neurons being highly sensitive to ethylbutanoate. So we wanted to look at the genetics underlying um, these changes. First off, OR22AB is predominantly composed of non-functional OR22B. So our first question was, well, is this actually functional? And if it is, what does it look like? To test this, we made a transgenic UAS OR22AB construct and expressed it in the empty neuron system, which in our case also works as a rescue experiment for AB3A function. When we did this, we found that the OR22AB gene was functional and that its response most closely resembled the AB3A2 phenotype. And so what's happening in, OR, in the AB3A3 phenotype? To test this, we uh, synthesized UAS constructs with either OR22A3 or OR22B3 individually and expressed these independently in the empty neuron system to see are they both functional and what do they look like? So in this case, um, OR22A3 is functional. However, the response profile that it gives very closely resembles the AP3A1 phenotype. OR22B3 is also functional in this case, and it gives a response that closely resembles the AB3A3 phenotype. Now, upon some further investigation, we actually found that it doesn't seem that OR22A3 is actually expressed in these flies. And so from this, we can conclude that OR22B 
3 alone is, de is determining AB3A3 response. So now that we understand this, we kind of want to look, wanted to look more at the broader picture. Why is there this differentiation between um, these alleles along the Australian coast? Is there something that could be behind it, such as a behavioural change associated with these changing phenotypes? And so our first port of call was to look at some electroantennogram recordings to see if there was any sort of compensation from other neurons on the antenna that might negate any changes that we were seeing due to this AB3A change. We again chose some dilutions of our um, key odorants and tested what the response to these was from an EAG. And what we found was that there were definitely differences. So it seems like there is compensation going on, especially at lower concentrations of these odorants. Um, so if we look at, for example, ethyl hexanoate at 10 to the minus 4, we can see that um, the AB3A1 has a much stronger response than the AB3A3. AB3, uh, sorry, than AB3A2. AB3A3 is a little bit confounded by the fact that the paraffin oil response is a little bit more diverse. Um, but we can see for AB3A3 that it has a much stronger ethyl butanoate response at 10 to the minus 4 than the other two phenotypes. And even at 10 to the minus 3, we can see a much stronger response for um, isopentyl acetate from the AB3A2 flies in the EAG experiment. So what this told us was that we had some possible um, reason to think that there might be um, behavioural changes associated with these phenotypes. So we moved on to actually testing that. We used a two-choice cage assay that looks very similar to this, um, which we released a number of flies into and let them sort themselves into two bottles. The two I bottles contain either a control um, odorant or a, the control odorant with a test odorant added. And after the assay has run, we calculate the preference index according to this formula here. So looking at the difference between the flies in either tube or, um, divided by the total number of flies that actually made a choice to enter. We chose to test ethyl hexanoate as this is a known key odorant and it differs greatly between our phenotypes. And we chose to focus on the AB3A1 and AB3A2 phenotypes because we know that AB3A1 is down in the south and we know that AB3A2 is the phenotype associated with the deletion allele that we're seeing this differentiation in. We tested this at 10 to the negative 4 because this is where we're seeing a great difference and also we don't really see any response from the AB3A2 neuron at this concentration. And we tested transgenic flies expressing either OR22A or OR22AB in the empty neuron to try and keep the background, genetic background as consistent as possible. And what we saw when we did this was that they actually did show significant differences in their behaviours. Um, unfortunately, the genetic background wasn't completely identical, so we did a few more experiments to try and add further proof to this differentiation. First, we tested our homozygous lines that either had the AB3A1 phenotype or the AB3A2 phenotype. And for this, we actually tested of both females and males, whereas the previous experiment, we'd only tested females. We found that they showed the same trend in behaviour. And also, we found that there was no significant difference between males and females from the same line, showing that this is unlikely to be a sex-specific behavioural change. Um, and to add further evidence to this, we also tested a population from the north and a population from the south and found that they showed a, the same trend. Uh, the population from the north does have some of the OR22A or OR22B allele in it. So this is all well and good, but respond, changes in response to a single odorant aren't necessarily completely biologically, re biologically relevant and therefore might um, not drive any sort of environmental actual change out in the wild. So we decided to look at a more biologically relevant behaviour and a biologically relevant behaviour that related to this neuron and it's responding to fruit odorants. So to do this, we designed an oviposition assay as fruit flies need to find fruit to lay their eggs on. It looks a bit like this. We have nine plates. Each has fruit except for the middle one, which is a control, and they're randomised. The fruit is... Um, put into agarose that's dyed blue and this is just to remove visual inputs and textural inputs that could additionally influence the fly's behavior. Put 30 fe mated female flies in and see where they lay their eggs. We chose, um, cheers. We chose eight fruits for this, four that are grown in the temperate south of Australia 
eight ap apple, apricot, pear, and strawberry, and four that are grown in the tropical north, banana, mango, pineapple, and pomelo. When we ran this assay with our um, homozygous limes, we saw that for most of the fruits, the response was pretty similar, um, with the exception of apricot, which the um, AB3A1 flies preferred, and banana, which the AB3A2 flies preferred, which kind of makes sense because this is the southern allele and this is the southern fruit and this is the northern allele and this is the northern fruit. Um, we can also compile this into a northern versus southern preference index, although admittedly most of the variation is going to be coming from these two, but we do find that AB301 flies don't really prefer either northern or southern fruits and AB3A2 flies strongly prefer, or prefer anyway, the northern fruits. So overall, we have this allelic differentiation along the eastern coast of Australia. There is um, neuron response differences associated with this differentiation. And these neuron response differences appear to be associated with a change in behavior that could potentially be driving this differentiation, although there are still a number of unanswered questions. And this also doesn't take into account what's happening with that third phenotype that we found in the north. So I just wanted to thank um, my PhD supervisors. This is slightly older work, but Coral, um, Maureen and Alicia, members of the labs from when I undertook this work, and then these people for reagents, stocks and for funding from CSIRO. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, great work. So yeah, we already received questions from David Hacker. So David, can you ask a question? David? I, just wondered, I just wondered whether in the R22 locus, there are repeats or transposable elements that facilitated the un, unequal crossing over, generating that uh, new allele. Not that I'm aware of, but OR22A and OR22B actually have really high similarity. So it's possible that it's just coming from unequal crossing over between the two of them because they're so similar, rather than some sort of transposable element. There's um, certainly duplications and deletions at this locus in um, other even closely related Drosophila species. So I think um, Ananasse show four copies and then a couple of pseudogenes as well. Great, thank you. We also received a question from Nobaki. Um, thanks for nice talk. I just wonder the behavior pattern of heterozygote uh, expressing both OR22A and 22A AB. So we didn't have time to look into the behavior of the heterozygote, but that would definitely be a really interesting question, especially sort of up in those middle and higher latitudes where we are seeing both of those alleles present to see, you know, what is that um, heterozygote doing? Okay, thanks. We also received a question uh, from Anna Chowin. So her question is, have you studied the axonal projections to the antenna low, uh, OR22B or OR22AB targeting other glomerulate? Thanks. Uh, no, we didn't look at that. Um, I know that that's definitely been characterized for the Canton S and what's happening with that. Um, but I, we didn't look at it in our case. Okay. So any other question? So I have a question. Did you find that other insects have similar, um, similar phenomenon? Like they also have this OR22A or OR22AB or other Drosophila or other insect species, any other? We didn't look into that, but what we did do is we went and recorded the AV3 response from um, other closely related Drosophila species. And what it actually looks like is that the AV3A3 neuronal phenotype is the ancestral phenotype. So make of that what you will. Um, but it is known that, like I said, um, even closely related Drosophila species have variation in copy number at this locus. Um, so I think and, and pseudogenization, excuse my pronunciation, also has also occurred at this locus. I think 
it's been a little while, but from memory in Seche uh, in Seychelles, maybe. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. If no other question, yeah. Thank you, Catherine. And, Thanks again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I will hand over to Cora. Thanks, Wei. Um, so we've had a few, um, it's really fascinating. I'm seeing that some of the people from Europe start to join us now um, in our audience, which is fantastic. So I'll just give another reminder that um, if you're an attendee and you would like to ask a question, you need to use the Q&A. You can make that question anonymous there if you would like to. Um, if you are a, a, a speaker and you're in a panelist group, you can either ask your question in the chat or you can actually just raise your hand um, when we ask for questions, whichever suits you. So our next speaker um, is um, Hidehiro Watanabe, and I apologise if I have said that <laughs> wrong, um, and he's going to talk to us about um, sex pheromone reception in the American cockroach, and I'd also like to thank him for agreeing to switch time, his time at the last minute when we discovered that one of our speakers who we thought was in China was actually in um, the US. <laughs> so thank you. Can you see Yes, we can see. Okay. 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 Thank you for organizing the exciting symposium. I'm Hidehiro Watanabe studying the cockroach olfaction in Japan. It is a great honor for me to present our studies in this symposium. This is a good opportunity to share the interesting topics of the cockroach olfaction. In my short presentation, I will briefly explain post-embryonic development of sexual reception in the, in the American cockroach. First, I introduce my animal, the American cockroach. The American cockroach is a major pest in city environment. The cockroach shows nocturnal habits and its behavior is highly related on uh, odors uh, received by long, two long antennae. To control the pest insect, uh, <coughs> sex and aggregation pheromone have been identified. In addition, the cockroach is very suitable for uh, in vivo electrophysiology and neural anatomy. Before the age of molecular biology, the, the American cockroach is one of the best model uh, insects to study neural basis of olfaction. In the cockroach, uh, peripheral coding of odors and central processing of odors have been well identified. For example, uh, olfactory response spectra of olfactory sensory neurons are, are comprehensively studied by uh, single sensium recordings. Uh, olfactory circuits from peripheral to higher brain centers are well understood uh, at the level of single cells uh, by intercellular recordings. <coughs> Order guided behavior and the pheromone guided behavior and its neural base have been studied. But the uh, uh, molecular basis of olfaction is still unknown because of uh, its very long life cycle. Uh, but I believe that uh, the long life cycle is not the weak point of the cockroach. The cockroach become uh, adult from after 11 molds. It needs about one year from here to here. The long life cycle of the cockroach make difficult to uh, perform genetic experiments such as uh, CRISPR, uh, CRISPR Cas. Uh, but we recently found RNAi performed in NIFAR stage in the strong effect in adults, and it enables to study molecular basis of production in the cockroach. My PhD student, Kosuke, presents the recent results of cockroach olfactory receptor using this method in the next presentation. Here, I took another merit of the long life of the cockroach, post-embryonic development of the cockroach uh, olfactory system. In the cockroach, a major olfactory circuits are formed during early, uh, develop, early development. So very small early instant nymphs has all glomeruli in the antenna lobe and all projection neurons and well-organized machine body. Only olfactory sensory neurons and canyon cells uh, in machine body are newly developed during this uh, growth. However, the cockroach exhibits uh, stage-dependent olfactory behaviors. Sex pheromones selectively uh, uh, activate uh, adult male cockroach, but not in nymphs. Uh, aggregation pheromone effectively attracts early instant nymphs, but, in, but not in adult. So studying the post-embryonic changes of olfactory system must reveal the neural basis of pheromone behaviors. Uh, 
uh, by uh, comparing the uh, olfactory systems between these animals. We focus on sex pheromone reception in the cockroach. In the cockroach, sex pheromone is composed uh, by uh, paper on A, PA, and paper on B, PB. This video showing the sexual behaviors. Sex pheromones are soaked in the cotton and put in your breeding cages. Uh, there are many nymphs and females, uh, but uh, sex pheromones selectively activated uh, adult male cockroaches. So in the cockroach, sex pheromone reception and processing have been studied using adult males, but not in nymphs. First, I briefly explain sex pheromone reception in the cockroach. The cockroach antenna has, uh, uh, has two types of bashconic sensor. Uh, 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 the uh, <coughs> shorter single word A sensor and uh, longer uh, single word B sensor, SWA and SWB. Uh, the longer SWB is sex pheromone responsive. Each SWB sensorium has four sensory neurons. Uh, among them, two sensory neurons selectively respond to PA and the PB. So we call the P PA sensory neuron and the PB sensory neuron. Like other insects, sex pheromone sensor are adult male specific, adult male specific. In adult male, SWB densely distributed on the throughout the long antennae. Uh, uh, the uh, cockroach uh, lack pupil stage, so a large number of SWB suddenly appear throughout the antenna at the final mode. My first question is how the cockroach develop SWB without the pupil stage? This email, uh, I found there are two strategies to increase the number of sex hormone uh, sensors throughout the antenna. These images show the proximal region of last insta and adult antennae. The last insta antenna lack uh, olfactory sensor in the proximal region. But there are a large number of uh, sensor, uh, majorly SWB, appear uh, in adult in the proximal regions, like uh, white dot uh, around this. <coughs> the cockroach antenna elongate at every mold. This mechanism is very simple. This image shows the uh, last insta antenna and the uh, adult antenna formed in the last insta antenna. Uh, these layers uh, corresponding to the segments of adult antenna. This experiment reveals that proximal segment of the antenna divided into about 30 segments. At every mold, new segments are added to the proximal antenna by dividing the proximal segment of the uh, 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 proximal segments. In males, a large number of SWB is newly formed on the proximal new segment at the final mode. Sensual formation is the first strategy to increase the number of sex pheromone sensors. Second, second strategy is sensual elongation. We directly compare the nymphal antenna and uh, the last insta antenna and the adult antenna formed in the nymphal antenna. In middle and uh, distal part of the antenna, new segment did not form. There are one to one correspondence of segments. And all nymphal uh, uh, sensor uh, labeled here and labeled here uh, is con uh, conserved on the adult antenna. But in male antenna, short SWA uh, elongate and change to sex pheromone responsive SWB, like that. At the final mold, SWA morphologically changed to SWB by elongating the sensual structure. To increase the number of SWB throughout the antenna, the male uh, cockroach has two strategies, sensual formation and sensual elongation. Especially, sensual elongation may be specific features in the heavy metabolous insects. And it arises two questions. First, do the nymphal SWA has uh, sex pheromone responsive sensory neurons, PA sensory neurons, and PB sensory neurons. Second, does the sensual uh, elongation uh, affect sensitivity of existing sen uh, sensory neurons? To confirm these questions, we performed electrophysiological experiment from SWA, uh, last insta SWA and uh, adult SWB. <coughs> We performed single sensual recordings from adult SWB and uh, last insta SWA. 
corresponding to the previous, uh, uh, this is a uh, recorded sensor and uh, uh, electrode was inserted the basement of the uh, sensor. Uh, corresponding to the previous report, both PA and the PB elicit spike activities in SW, adult SWB. Uh, both PA and the PB elicit similar uh, small amplitude spikes. But uh, we confirmed uh, PA and the PB activated uh, PA sensor in neuron and the PB sensor in neuron respectively. Interestingly, in last instant NIMF, SWA uh, also exhibited uh, excitatory responses to PA and the PB. Our results strongly suggest that uh, the NIMFAL cockroach can sense sex pheromones, uh, but they did not show any uh, behavioral response to sex pheromones. To estimate the number of sensory neurons, we sorted the spike be spikes based on uh, spike shapes. Generally, we identified four sensory neurons in last instant uh, SWA, and it is uh, not different to uh, the adult SWB. Spike size and the responsivities of four sensory neurons are also conserved. It suggests that sensory neurons in SWA may be maintained in adult SWB. <clears throat> we compare the uh, sensitivity of PB sensory neurons to PB between last instant SWA and adult SWB. In uh, SWA, PB sensory neurons started to respond to 0 0.5 nanogram of PB and uh, reach a plateau at uh, 2 nanogram of PB. In adult, SWB uh, started to respond to uh, 0 0.1 nanogram of PB and reach a plateau at 0 0.5 nanogram PB. Uh, similar results are obtained in PA sensory neurons to PA. Our results indicate that both uh, NIFAR, last instant SWA, and adult SWB exhibited high sensitivity to uh, sex pheromones, but the sensitivity of PB sensory neurons in SWA is lower than uh, that of in adult SWB. However, <laughs> However, PB sensory neurons, in uh, uh, so this result indicates that PB sensory neurons in different sensor types exhibit different sensitivity to ligand. We cannot so we cannot deny the possibility that these sensory neurons are expressing the different pheromone receptors. Because sex pheromone receptors have not functionally identified in the cockroach, we examine the target glomerity of the PB sensory neurons in both adult SWB and uh, last instant SWA uh, by staining the OS uh, sensory neurons in a single sensor. This panel shows the results, uh, single LSM image and the reconstructed image of sensory neurons. Uh, the cockroach had 205 glomeruli in the antenna lobe. Among them, A glomerulus and B glomerulus are macroglomeruli processing the PA and the PB respectively. In adult male, PB sensory neurons uh, selectively project to a macroglomerulus, B glomerulus. B glomerulus. Uh, the last, last insta male also has B glomerulus, but uh, its size is significantly smaller than that of adult. Staining of SWA reveals that uh, PB sensory neurons in uh, SWA also project to B glomerulus. If one, glom one receptor, one glomerulus rule is applicable in the cockroach. These PB sensory neurons must express the same pheromone receptor. So different uh, sensitivity between SWA and SWB are not originated from different olfactory receptors. We summarize the dose response curve of PB sensory neurons to PB during post embryo development. Responses of early insta SWA uh, obtained from our previous results uh, uh, published uh, in last year. Uh, it suggests that sensitivity of PB sensory neurons to PB did not change during the near development. However, uh, corresponding to the uh, sensual elongation, the sensitivity is significantly increased. <clears throat> Despite the differences of sensual types, PB sensory neurons may be expressing the cognate pheromone receptor we concluded, we concluded that changes of sensual structure must affect the olfactory reception in the cockroach. Now, we are studying the mechanism of this phenomenon. But it's a final slide. Uh, 
Uh, because sex hormones selectively elicit behavioral response in adult cockroach, post-embryonic changes of development of sex hormone reception is one of the trigger of sexual behavior in the cockroach. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sidhiro. Um, that was that was fascinating. Have we got any questions from um, either the panel members? As I mentioned, you can put them in the chat or put up your hand, um, or attendees can put them in the Q and A. <clears throat> That's from the last one. Okay, so I guess I have one for you. Um, so you mentioned that your overall interest is starting to get at the molecular mechanisms behind some of this. Um, I would, particularly things like that sensorum switching from one type to another, there would be a bunch of candidate pathways that you could look at based on what's known about, you know, neuronal fate mechanisms in Drosophila. Is that something that you're thinking about doing? <laughs> so your question is molecular, me molecular mechanism, this phenomenon. So, so, so the, these, these, two, these two strategies for increasing um, the number of um, sensory responding to sex pheromone being the adding the segments or the elongation, et cetera. But the one where you had the, the one sensorum type switching to the other sensorum type you know, for mm -hmm. me, reminds me of something like the notch signaling pathway, yeah, for example. Mm -hmm. Is that an area of interest that you would like to explore? <laughs> uh, how, that, how that's controlled at the molecular level, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know the molecular mechanism of this phenomenon, but uh, now I'm tackling this uh, uh, mechanism, mechanisms underlying this phenomenon. So using some uh, uh, RNAi, or uh, some uh, transcriptome analysis. So mm -hmm. uh, my, my answer is like that. So. No, that's all right. I guess I guess my question is sort of what type of genes, what type of developmental genes are you looking at? <clears throat> so what what sort of developmental genes, genes involved in development? Uh, yes, I see, I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. that's fine. Um, Nobuaki has a question. Thanks. Um, do you have any, do you think even nymph is attracted to higher concentrations of pheromones? So it is a very good question, but, but uh, I uh, tried to, uh, my, uh, easy behavior experiment using the uh, no, uh, behavior, experiment. but uh, nymphs did not respond to high concentration of pheromones. Uh, maybe is there right. many, any mechanisms uh, of brain uh, brain processing? I see. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? One question is here in chat. Uh, I think that was. Oh, sorry. Chen Zhu has a question. Yep. Never mind. I think that's from earlier. Yeah, uh, I, we also checked the responses to PA and uh, uh, the increase of sensitivity was observed uh, also in PA, uh, PA sensory neurons to PA. So yes, sorry, the question had been, yeah, what about responses to PA? So thank you, I'd missed that one. <clears throat> Did anyone else have a question they would like to ask? All right. Oh. Uh, Teru, do you want to ask that one? Yeah, just a curiosity, but in our case, in when I do the SSL in the flies, I see like larger, larger um, uh, sensilla that OSN usually have the larger amplitude. Um, but mm, I see. is that the yeah, elongated uh, sensilla? Maybe I think it's like larger sensilla that I suppose. So 
uh, uh, maybe the adult cockroach compared to the nymph, uh, elong the elongated sensilla in the adult stage, they tend to show the like larger amplitude compared to the nymph or factory sensor neurons. Yeah, we have checked the, the size of sensory neurons using uh, antib antibody staining. Uh, in uh, my uh, in our observations, so there are not the difference, uh, no, no differences of between uh, size of these sensory neurons. Mm. And uh, sex uh, sensory neurons to respond to sex pheromones very small amplitude spikes. So uh, maybe uh, it's a little bit small, smaller than uh, that uh, responding to olfactory uh, general orders. Mm, okay, thank you. All right, so thank you. So we might move on to the next talk. Um, so just to introduce the next speaker um, is Kusuki Tatishi. Um, so uh, also going to talk to us about um, his work on the American cockroach. So thank you. Can I see the slides? Yes. Thank you for organizing the symposium. I'm Kosuke Tateishi, PhD student in Fukuoka University in Japan. I studied the function of OCO in the American cockroach. Insects detect volatile odorants using two distinct types of olfactory receptors, odorant receptor OR and ionotropic receptor IR types. In my PhD, I am studying the process of olfactory reception in the American cockroach. In the antennae of a cockroach, olfactory sensilla are classified into three morphological types, perforate basiconic, tricoid, and groove basiconic sensilla. These sensilla are correspondence with olfactory sensilla in drosophere. Each type of sensilla are classified into a few subtypes by difference of shaft length and response properties. In the cockroach, olfactory ligands of these sensilla have been characterized. However, olfactory receptors is unknown in the cockroach. In this study, we focused on odorant receptor OR. ORs form heteromeric channels composed of ligand-specific binding receptor protein, ORX, and its co-receptor proteins, OR, uh, OCO. So, OCO mutant could, could not detect odorants through OSNS expressing ORs. In this study, we identified OCO gene from the cockroach genome and revealed the function of OCO for olfactory reception. I briefly show three results. Identification of the cockroach OCO and distribution pattern of OSN expressing OCO and the function of OCO for olfactory reception in the cockroach. We estimate OCO from the cockroach genome and compared with Drosophia OCO. Gray colors show the same or similar property of amino acid. In particular, the putative phosphorylation and Kanmo gene binding sites are conserved in OCO between the cockroach and the drosophere. Based on the sequence, we generated anti OCO antibody and double-stranded RNA for systemic RNAi. Next, we visualized the distribution pattern of OCO using the antibody. The antennae of adult male cockroaches were double immunolabeled with the anti-OCO and anti-HRP antibody. The anti-HRP antibody selectively labeled all OSN in the cockroach antennae, arrow headshots, dendrites of the OSNs. The anti-OCO antibody selectively labeled 
all OSNs in the perforated basic nick sensilla, SWA and SWB, but not in the grooved basic nick sensilla. Each tricoid sensilla, SWC1 and SWC2, has two OSNs. Interestingly, Orco positive OSNS is constantly paired with Orco negative OSN in the tricoid sensilla. It was schematically summarized in below. To characterize Orco function in the American cockroach, we combined RNA of Orco with single sensorium recordings. Ninfar and Adult cockroaches were injected with 4 micrograms of OCO DSRNA and performed SSRs, arbitrarily selected days after injection. Sensual responses in OCO RNA cockroaches were compared with those in naive cockroaches and equally beta lactamase, beta lac DSRNA cockroach, RNA cockroaches. First, we recorded from six pheromone responsive SWB sensura. Six pheromone of the cockroach is composed of periplanon A, PA, and periplanon B, PB. Single SWB sensura have PA sensory neuron and PB sensory neuron, and two OSNs responded to various general orders. These OSNs spontaneously fired the <coughs> large and the second largest spikes, respectively, whereas PASN and PBSN hardly show spontaneous activities. Here, we estimate RNA effects using the sex pheromone responses. It showed spike activity of PBSNs and response intensity response intensities are summarized as a graph. Black bars show average value. In a control group, PBSN exhibits strong phagic response to PB. On the other hand, the response was significantly impaired in more than seven days after injection with OCO DSRNA. The cockroach with OCO DSRNA at last Insta stage exhibit hardly responded to 2PB. It suggests that the RNA effect is long lasting in the cockroach. Furthermore, these showed spike activities of PBSNs, a PASNs. PASNs exhibit strong phagic response to, P P response to PA in a control group. On the other hand, the response was significantly impaired in R orco RNA cockroaches. These results showed sex pheromones in the cockroach are received by ORs. In addition, the OSN1 and OSN2 exhibit spontaneous activity in the control group. The spontaneous firing also significantly decreased in RNA cockroaches. This finding suggests that OCO contributes to generate spontaneous activity of OSNs in the cockroach. Next, we recorded from SWA, SWC2, uh, DWA2 sensor. This sensor receives general orders. First, we examined the RNA effect on SWA sensor. Heat map exhibits olfactory response spectra of SWA sensor to 10 general orders in control group and OCO RNA cockroaches. Olfactory responses are summarized at the level of each sensor. The stronger olfactory responses are denoted as darker red color. Heat map, show, uh, heat map show the different SWA sensilla exhibit, exhibit different olfactory response spectra. It suggests that OSNs in different SWA sensilla express different repertories of 
チューニング ORs。In オーコー RNA コクローチーズ。オルファクトリーレスポンシーズは、シグニフィカントリーインペアル。In addition, spontaneous activity は、シグニフィカントリーディクリーズ。These results show OSNS in SWA Sensira received general orders by ORs. The group of basic clinic Sensira housed OCO negative OSNS. Single S DWA2 Sensira constantly housed, to, housed OSNS tuned to acid. Uh, both, the, both the spontaneous activities and responses. To acid in DWA2 sensira were maintained in RNA cockroaches. Therefore, OSNS in group of basic clinic sensira received general orders by different olfactory receptor types. Finally, single tricoid sensira have an OCO positive OSN and OCO negative OSN. SSRs from a Subtype of tricoid sensira, SWC2 sensira, revealed there are OSNS with larger and smaller spikes, and OSNS with small spikes tuned to acids. Both the spontaneous activity and acid evoked responses of small spikes by <coughs> OCO RNA. Five minutes. Ah, ah sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Both the spontaneous activity and acid evoked responses of smaller spikes were not affected by RNA. On the other hand, the OSNS with larger spikes were affected by OLCO RNA because the spontaneous firing rate of the OSNS significantly decreased in RNA cockroaches. Taken together with these results, the OSNS expressing the functional ORs constantly paired with acid responsive OSNS in tricoid sensira. In conclusion, we identified the whole sequence of OCO gene in the cockroach periparenta americana and established the RNA experiments. We characterized the OCO expression pattern and its function for order receptions. Especially, this study revealed sex pheromones are received by ORs. Interestingly, in single tricoid sensira, an uh, OCO positive OSN always paired with an uh, OCO negative OSN. Our study showed the unique feature of cockroach olfaction. Thank you for listening to my presentation. So our next speaker um, I'll hand over to uh, is David Heckel. Let me just find your introductory slide, David. <clears throat> And share that. So David, it is great to see you. I haven't seen you for a long time. Um, David is joining us today. So we've now um, moved away from the a Asia and we're entering Europe. Um, and David is joining us from the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena in Germany. And he's going to talk to us about um, sex pheromone choice in male European corn borer moths. So thanks, David, and please start sharing your slides. Thank you, Carl. I'm delighted to join the Australian section because I spent many happy years in, in Melbourne where I, where I met uh, Carl and um, before moving to Germany. But I'd like to tell you about um, our work with the European corn borer. Uh, this species has been a model system for pheromone studies for many years. The sex pheromone is very simple. It contains only two components that differ only in the configuration of the double bond. These are acetate esters. And then the two strains simply differ in the relative amounts of these two made by the female pheromone gland. Concomitantly, males of the two strains exhibit a strong preference for the blend made by the females. Z strain males um, really only respond to this 95%, uh, 3% ratio. E strain males have a somewhat broader response, but also the optimal to the blend made by the um, 
by the, uh, by the females. Working with Christa Lustad and uh, Jean-Marc Lassens in uh, Lund, we were able to uh, find the genetic variation for the female pheromone production. Now the precursors, the two desaturated precursors are made in equal amounts in both strains. So with the same substrate pool, the specificity is caused by the enzyme, a reductase that reduces these precursors to alcohols. And there's amino acid differences in the two uh, allelic forms of the enzymes that give rise to the specificity there. And so um, a single autosomal gene with allelic variation explains the female uh, uh, production. The male behavioral response is known to be uh, sex-linked for a long time. Eric Doppman was the first to construct a linkage map for the European corn borer with AFLPs, and he mapped the response gene onto the Z uh, chromosome. And then uh, Jean-Marc Lassens, and, uh, and he showed that, uh, however, the male response locus, behavioral locus, mapped to a different uh, part of the Z chromosome to the ORs. So the ORs that are known to uh, respond to these pheromone components are also sex linked, but they're genetically distinct from the male behavioral response. So that's where uh, we came in and we decided to use a QTL mapping approach using a quantitative behavioral score for each male um, rather than um, uh, of the all or none um, uh, flight towards the, uh, towards the lure and the flight tunnel. And so in this case here, the male is confined, but then exposed to alternative uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, pheromone uh, blends. And then depending on the level of excitement, we had a quantitative score uh, for the response of the male. So these are backcross males, we cross the two strains together and then backcross to the Z strain. And so these males are carrying either the Z chromosome or the uh, E-derived chromosome of the Z chromosome. <clears throat> and using this quantitative score, we were able to narrow the interval along the Z chromosome uh, to a region that was also distinct from the ORs, but uh, contained about 15 candidate genes, many of which were expressed in the brain and the antenna. And so we had to move to another method for the finer scale mapping. And that is to define the uh, outer regions of this interval <clears throat> with markers, and then look for crossovers or, or recombinational breakpoints in the middle uh, of that region. And so um, a number of primers were designed for genes in the middle there. And uh, what we had to do is actually uh, take back cross males, take a leg, genotype them, see if there was a recombination or not, and then use the same male in a mating to start a recombinant inbred line if there was a crossover. And, uh, and then when we fixed the line to score the behavioral response. So crossing over will create junctions between the E and the Z origin of the Z chromosome at different points. We screen for these uh, 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 recombinants in that response regions make recombinant inbred lines, test the males, and then try to find the narrowest interval that has a perfect correlation of that region, um, the origin of that region from E or Z grandparent and the E or Z behavioral response. So this required uh, creating 80 recombinant inbred lines, which is very difficult because this is all single pair matings over three or four generations. But what we were able to do is actually narrow down the interval to contain a single gene. So the smallest interval we could find contains just one gene, uh, bric-a-brac. And bric-a-brac in, in Drosophila at least is a well-known uh, member of a very large family of transcription factors that has many, many, many roles in, uh, in the insect. And the, um, the striking thing about the genomic organization in Astrinia is that there's a huge intron of 200 and 30 KB uh, in the first intron in Astrinia. And in fact, all of the moth genomes we looked at also have a huge, maybe even 300 KB, a gigantic intron in between the first exon and the rest uh, uh, of the gene. And so um, we, um, uh, Fotini Kuntrupa uh, started to look at the expression of bric-a-brac in Astrinia nubilalis. And she was able to find uh, sex in specific tissue specific 
expression by RT-QTCR in a number of different tissues. In the antenna of the male at day two or day seven, there is a difference between the two strains and the level of expression of bric-a-brac in the male antenna. Um, there are actually slightly different opposite relationships in the male uh, brain. And, um, and so um, there are some differences in the females as well. Using in situ uh, with RNA probes, where both bric-a-brac and orco were labeled, uh, she could show that there is a co-expression of these two genes in the same cells of the pupil antenna. So you get them merged with the yellow in the same cells. But as the antenna develops uh, the co-localization in separate cells of orco and bric-a-brac in the sensillum in, in the adult. So uh, bric-a-brac is certainly expressed in the antenna and the brain and the spinia nubilatus, but the differences between the two strains is, is very, very subtle indeed. Now in Drosophila melanogaster, um, this gene is duplicated. So there's actually two bric-a-brac genes uh, they're in a tandem repeat in Drosophila melanogaster, bric-a-brac one and bric-a-brac two. And this has been intensively studied because um, the expression level of one or both of them does affect many phenotypes. In particular, there's a sexually dimorphic pigmentation of the adult abdominal segments. Uh, the male has uh, heavily pigmented segments and the female does not. And so focusing on that specific phenotype, uh, many, many enhancer bashing experiments were done in which it was possible to um, correlate the expression of um, uh, of this enhancer with, uh, with GFP and correlating with the expression. And so uh, two separate binding sites for transcription factors have been found in the enhancer uh, bric-a-brac in, in Drosophila melanogaster. Also, it's been, uh, it has a role in the um, differentiation of the Drosophila antenna. There are overlapping concentric zones of these two genes, as well as other transcription factors that have been shown to then specify the diversity of the olfactory receptor neurons in, in the developing an, antenna. So we can imagine many, many roles for uh, bric-a-brac one and bric-a-brac two in, 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 in our system, but we really have to argue by analogy to the uh, Drosophila system of where the tools are uh, much, much more powerful. Now, um, we were rather mystified by our finding here. And so we were absolutely delighted when Eric Dopman uh, approached us and said that he had been independently working on, on this from a different perspective entirely. And so in connection with other studies that he's been doing on Voltanism, they had a series of paired pheromone traps in a transect going from north to south. Each pair, one trap is uh, labeled with, is baited with the E blend and the other for the Z blend. Then they would collect males from different geographic regions from these two traps, and then isolate DNA and then do pool sequencing from these males. So the males are actually sorting themselves out uh, phenotypically with respect to their attraction to these two pheromone traps. And so they sequenced all of the, uh, the entire genome there, overlaid them on the existing genome that uh, Brad Coates had had, and the only, regions with significant differentiation among the two strains was in bric-a-brac. So um, I mean it's... none on the Z chromosome, uh, only on the Z chromosome and only in this uh, interval here, all in the intron. And so this tells us there's something pretty important about the intron. There are not any consistent coding sequence differences between the two strains. The action is the intron. So we already know from previous studies that the E and the Z strains differ in how the E and the Z responding neurons are actually connected to the glomeruli in the antenna lobe of the brain. And the difference between these two strains is there's simply a switch in the projection. And so the E responding neuron projects to the larger glomerulus in the E strain. The Z expressing neuron projects to the larger expressing uh, glomerulus in the Z strain. So our working hypothesis is somehow a difference in the level of expression of bric-a-brac um, somehow uh, affects this. 
There are similar systems in moths and flies. So an example from Chen Zhu Wang's uh, lab, the two species, Helicoverpa armidra and Asalta, use different ratios of the same two compounds. And in that species, in those two species, the uh, sensory factory neuron progressions to the glomeruli are switched in the two species. Very recently, um, uh, from Jeff Feeder's lab and Sharon Olson's lab, the uh, famous uh, apple maggot fly, Ragolitis pomonella, um, in which in North America evolved a new host that is apple from the wild host Hawthorne. Um, now they have the same, the two uh, host strains have the same ORs, uh, but these ORs have opposite responses to two different compounds, one from Hawthorne and one from apple. And it turns out the glomeruli in the antenna lobe of the two strains have switched their responses to these two uh, compounds. Also in Bombyx mori, as, um, as we learned from Carl Ernst Keisling, a very important uh, system there, there's a mutant, a deletion of ACJ6, another transcription factor that leads to also a rewiring between BOEM uh, uh, OR1 and OR3, leading these mutant males to be attracted to Bombicol, not Bombicol. And we really thought it was ACJ6, but that maps to the wrong end of the Z chromosome. There were some very interesting antennal transplant experiments done a long time ago in which it looked like the genotype of the brain, not the antenna, controls the male response to the uh, edroma. But unfortunately, there was only one experiment done, and we don't know if these manipulations really mean that the signal is coming from the antenna or not. So to summarize, we think there's at least two modalities of the evolution of the male pheromone response, changes in the structure of the odorant receptors, which has occupied most people's attentions up to now. And we also find it can be very, very important to change the signal transmission to the brain. And we've recently published this work in Nature Communications just about a month ago. So I end with thanks to my collaborators, which is really a multidisciplinary approach it wouldn't really have been possible without the long-term resources I could devote to it from the Max Planck Society. So I'm very, very grateful for that support as well. And um, thanks for your attention and I'm ready for questions. Thank you, David. Um, lovely to see all that genetics in there. <laughs> um, so uh, we're open for questions and we've got quite a lot of new attendees. So just a reminder, as an attendee, you can put your question, you need to put your question in the Q&A to type it in there. You can type it in there at any time during the talk. You don't have to wait until the end. If you are a panellist, you can um, either put up your hand or you can write your question in the chat um, for us, whichever uh, works for you. So questions for David. And I do see now why we had the question about the glomeruli switching earlier, <laughs> now that I've heard about your fascinating examples. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just giving everyone a minute, David, because we've got lots of changing people at the moment. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll start and I'll, I'll make an apology for missing something because I was dealing with the technology. But the two, the two genes in flies that you mentioned in Drosophila um, is, was one of, so one of them was in, involved in ORN development in Drosophila as well. Was that correct? <laughs> uh, yes, and I really can't tell you which one. Many of the studies actually don't make a distinction, which makes it a little more a little more confusing. And so there's partially overlapping um, uh, uh, functions of these two, but actually the double knockout is female, female sterile. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's the same thing in our species, that's going to make it useless for our studies because we need to develop a homozygous line in order to do, do the testing. Mm -hmm. No problem. Do we have, other questions from panel members or any attendees, or David. 
because we do have some time. <laughs> Okay. I might also add um, another thing that people familiar with this system might be uh, aware of, and that is um, with the discovery of the sex linkage of <clears throat> the male behavioral response, another phenotype was discovered, and that is the amplitude of the firing of the E and the Z uh, containing uh, uh, response neurons. That was also different in the two host strains. And Bill Hansen and Krista Lerstedt showed that that was due to an independently segregating autosomal uh, locus. So we were very, in, but subsequent studies showed that that was not correlated with the male behavioral response. And so working with Shannon Olson, we tried to uh, recapitulate this and we're not able to actually uh, get the same result. We find a sex linked response to the, and, uh, to the amplitude of the response but it's a much smaller difference than Hansen and Luff said studied. So there's a, a few loose ends left in this system uh, that I think would mm -hmm. repay further study. Thanks, David. All right, so I don't think we have any other questions. So we will move on because um, uh, Alice, Alice is with us, who is our next speaker. Um, who is joining us from uh, London. I'll just put up your introductory slide, Alice, before you share your slides. Carl, I think that there are some questions from Q&A. I can't see those. Oh, there's, okay. I think they've come in a little bit late. All right, we yeah. might not take, take those because we are a little bit early, Alice. So, um, so we have a question from um, Eduardo Hitano. Are there other examples of bric-a-brac in other species besides Drosophila and corn borers? In addition, what expression levels of bric-a-brac bric look like in ZE hybrids? Uh, hi, Eduardo. Thanks for your uh, question. Um, in Drosophila, as I mentioned, um, but it hasn't really been looked at in Bombyx, whether bric-a-brac could play a role. And we have not looked at the expression in, in, in the hybrids. Now, the hybrids are rather interesting because the male hybrids have a much broader response and they respond to uh, very, very, very different levels. And um, in the hybrids also, it's known that um, that's correlated with the more equal size of the two glomeruli. So it would be interesting to look at the expression of bric-a-brac in the hybrids, but we just haven't done it. And we have a second question that says, um, thank you, Professor David. Uh, are the two pheromone components, or do they travel together and reach the antenna at the same time? Do we know this? Um, we have not looked at that. I would imagine they're pretty close, but uh, in our studies, that really wouldn't have made very difference because the lure is so close uh, to the insect. So that's a question for Tom Baker, for example. No problem. <laughs> um, and then we have a comment from um, Zolt Kapati. Uh, I also measured the volume differences of the Z and E glomeruli, and it was sex linked. <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. And so it's a little puzzling because we've got um, sex linked um, volume differences, but a dominant, an E dominant wiring. And in the um, uh, armidra and assalta example, also there was armidra dominance. So figuring out exactly what's dominant, what's intermediate is um, uh, still also has to be worked out. Great. All right. Thank you. So we'll close your talk now and we'll move on. So our next speaker um, is joining us from um, Imperial College in London. Um, so thank you, Alice, for joining us early in your morning. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about sensory processing during sleep in Drosophila. So um, please feel free to share your slides, Alice. Yes, you're all good. All right, well, um, thank you very much for the introduction, Coral, and, and for the invitation to speak today. Um, I hope that this, this work isn't too kind of left field for this symposium, but it is about olfaction, I promise you, so uh, bear with me. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk to you about a project I've been working on for a few years now, and it's finally kind of in press and it's going to be published soon, so 
um, you're sort of getting a bit of a sneak peek here. Um, so this, this project's about sensory processing during sleep, and it was kind of devised based on some, some observations that we saw on the London Underground. So yes, we, we sort of devised this project based on some observations from the London Underground. And I kept witnessing people sleeping on the train, and this is really not an environment that's particularly conducive to sleep. It's extremely noisy, and you have people kind of chatting and hustle and bustle, and you have these very loud station announcements. <clears throat> and what was even more remarkable is people seem to be able to sleep through this and then sort of spontaneously wake up when their, um, their station is called and get off the train. So it seems that people are able to sort of sort of discriminate between sort of important and non-important information whilst asleep. And I started to sort of think about this and, and thought about experiences from my own life. And I'm I'm a very deep sleeper and um, famously slept through the storm of 1987. And um, and this sort of changed when I had my daughter Izzy and I became very, very acutely aware of tiny sort of baby noises during the night and find myself sort of sitting bolt upright in bed following kind of a little uh, gurgle or a murmur. So it does seem that we're able to sort of sort of process sensory information during sleep. Now I realize this is all of this is quite anecdotal and there has been some actual evidence to sort of investigate this phenomenon. Um, this is largely done in the context of fire safety, so trying to find kind of audible alarms and things like that, which would most appropriately wake people up. Um, and what they found was that sounds that are closest to human speech are the most effective at waking people up. And this is sort of independent of the intensity of the stimulus. In another study, um, sleep participants were asked to um, sleep with an EEG on, and during sleep, they were kind of reeled off a series of names. Some of these names were sort of had meaning to them, so it might be their own name or a name of a family member or something like this. And amongst these names were others that didn't hold any meaning to them, so sort of like your average Joe Bloggs or John Doe. And what they found was that people were much more likely to wake up when they heard their own name um, or the name of some, uh, a name of someone that meant something to them compared to um, one that had no meaning. So it really does seem that people are able to sort of discriminate between important and non-important information during sleep. And it, and it really begs the question, how is valence encoded by the sleeping brain? And really, how do we begin to sort of answer this question? <clears throat> So like many of us, um, we turn to the humble fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, um, to try and begin, this, uh, begin to answer this question. So in Giorgio's lab, we're primarily interested in sleep and, um, and do a lot of, sort of behavioral experiments. And what we use to do this is um, um, a machine called Ethoscope, which was kind of the brainchild of Giorgio, very talented PhD student in the lab, Quentin Geisman, and um, Luis Garcia, an engineer. And essentially what it is, is a, um, you have a Raspberry Pi and a camera, and, in these, and then you have glass tubes containing individual flies. And what, what we do is we, we track the location or the coordinates of the fly in the tube over time. And from this, we can extrapolate various information, like how fast they're moving, whether they're awake, whether they're asleep, whether they're feeding or grooming. And we've designed various kind of hardware plugins or torture devices in the lab. Um, some, for example, we have one which can uh, rotate the tubes in order to sleep deprive them. Um, but this is one that I invented called the air gas and odor delivery device. Um, and basically what it allows us to do is interact with individual fruit flies in real time. Um, so what, what basically happens is when uh, an immobility bout of five minutes or more is detected, um, this activates a sort of valve system um, in, in the AGO, and we're able to deliver a puff, a five second puff of air, or which is the mechanical control in this case, or odor. And then in the 10 seconds following uh, from the onset of the puff, uh, we see whether, they, whether the fly remains asleep or whether they're woken up. Obviously, this is, this is a binary measure. Do they wake up or do they not? And, um, and then from this, we can create sort of um, averages 
uh, per time bin per fly. And this is this tends to be what I'm plotting in all of the subsequent um, all the subsequent um, graphs. <clears throat> So one of the, the first odors that we wanted to test was acetic acid um, as it's uh, ecologically relevant um, odorant for fruit flies. Um, it is the main component of vinegar and it's produced by fermenting fruits. And typically um, sort of the, as, as uh, fruits sort of ripen, uh, they produce more acetic acid. So higher concentrations tend to be associated with spoiled or rotten fruits and are reversive and lower concentrations tend to be associated with kind of ripe um, and appetitive kind of um, sort of concentration sorry um, lower concentrations are attractive and associated with ripe fruits so the first thing we wanted to do was verify this in our lab and um, we did a couple of um, behavioral um, tests so we did a trap assay um, and a y maze assay and um, on this bottom left hand um, graph, you can see on the x axis you have ascending concentrations of acetic acid, and on the y axis you have the preference index uh, from the um, from the y maze. And lower concentrations, uh, sort of one, three, five percent, are attractive and have a pos positive preference index. And as the concentration increases to ten, thirty, or hundred percent, you get negative preference index. Uh, uh, preference indexes and this indicates aversion. So just through using different concentrations of acetic acid we have a range of valences uh, that we can test in the AGO. So one of the first things that we did was we probed sleeping flies uh, with air or 1%, 5%, 10% or 30% acetic acid over a 24-hour period. And what we saw interestingly was that the lower concentrations of acetic acid, uh, the one and five percent, were more likely to wake the flies up compared to air or ten percent and thirty percent acetic acid. And this was true for various time points during the day. So, does that give a time four and six? Does that give a time eighteen to twenty? And also, when we look at the full twenty-four hour period. <clears throat> so, in the case of acetic acid, we saw that lower attractive concentrations are more likely to to wake up red flies. Um, and we were wondering whether this was a general phenomenon, whether attractive odorants are more likely to, to wake, wake flies up. Um, so what we did is we expanded our panel of odorants to uh, encompass a range from aversive uh, to neutral to attractive. So aversive odorants included sort of benzaldehyde, josmine, CO2, and attractive concentration, uh, attractive odorants include sort of fruit pulps like fig and kiwi, um, apple cider vinegar, acetic acid, and, and these kind of things. And then we have MCH as a, as a neutral odorant. Um, what we did was verify these predicted valences in the uh, trap assays. And on the axis of this graph on the right-hand side, you can see the preference index ranging from uh, 0 point, uh, minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. And on the y-axis, we have the, the mean response per fly in the AGO. And what we actually found was the opposite to acetic acid, the more aversive the odorant, the more likely it is to wake them up. However, this wasn't the case uh, when we started looking in starved animals. So in this experiment, we tested the same panel of odorants as the previous slide, um, but this time we looked at both starved and fed conditions. Um, in 16 out of 20, eight of the uh, odorants in the panel, uh, under starved, uh, starved conditions, we saw an increase in response or waking response. Um, and this was largely confined to odors relating to food. Um, <clears throat> so this is quite an interesting finding. So it's interesting that we didn't see a global, that sort of an increase in all of the odorants and uh, that this, uh, this increase in arousal was specific to food related odors. And this, this points to sort of, sort of specific sensory kind of processing during sleep rather than a global adjustment in arousal thresholds. So next we wanted to sort of delve into the sort of circuitry a little bit and we started to look at the mushroom body output neurons, which they do as they say on the tin, they're the output neurons of the mushroom bodies. We're interested in these for various reasons. So firstly we know that the mushroom bodies is an important odor processing center in, in the brain. Um, mushroom body output neurons are important for sleep regulation, some are weight promoting, some are sleep promoting, 
And we also know that these neurons are involved in valence encoding in root line. And so we're very interested to sort of see whether these odorants might be involved in this, in this phenomenon. So what we did is we expressed a temperature sensitive, uh, sorry, a Shibiri temperature sensitive in various GAL4 lines corresponding to mushroom body output neurons. Um, we put flies in the AGOs at 29 degrees Celsius, and we probed them during sleep with 5% acetic acid. And what we observed was with one particular line, MB011B, we saw an increase in arousal in response to 5% acetic acid when this neuron was inhibited. So this suggests that this Okay. This suggests that this mushroom body output neuron is involved in sleep persistence as inhibiting it actually increases arousal. Next, we used a, a transsynaptic labeling technique called TransTango um, to look at where neurons downstream of uh, these mushroom body output neurons were actually uh, projecting to in the brain. <clears throat> and interestingly, we found that four out of five of these, these mushroom body output neurons were actually, sent, uh, were actually projecting to the fan-shaped body which is an important sleep center in um, the, fruit fly, the fruit fly brain. <clears throat> so MB011B, the, the mushroom body output neuron candidate, which um, had a phenotype, um, innovates layers eight and nine of the fan-shaped body. So we wanted to test various fan-shaped body GAL4 lines that had presynaptic zones in the fan-shaped body. So we selected R38 EO7, which had presynaptic zones in layers eight and nine, corresponding to where the presynaptic zones of um, MB011B downstream neurons were found. Um, we also wanted to look at a couple of negative controls. So um, C205, which has presynaptic zones in layer six, and then R89 EO7, which is in six, four, and one. And again, we expressed Shibiri temp temperature sensitive in these, um, in these different neural subsets. And we observed that when we inhibit R38 EO7, we actually see an increase in arousal as we did when we inhibited MB011B. So it does suggest that the, there might be some sort of functional connectivity between these neurons and, and, and the, these fan shaped body neurons might be downstream of the mushroom body output neuron. But earlier in the presentation, I spoke about how starvation modulates um, the arousal response to specifically to food related odors. So um, when starved, flies are more likely to wake up in response to food-related odors. Now we know that the PAM neurons are sensitive to starvation, um, so we decided to sort of start here, basically. Um, I found this particular GAL4 called GMR58 EO2, and this has um, presynaptic zones in gamma-5 of the, um, the mushroom body, uh, in gamma-5 lobe of the mushroom bodies, and, and this is sort of corresponding where to the postsynaptic zones of MB011B are found. Um, using GRASS, we sort of verified a functional connectivity between the mushroom body output neuron and the PAM neuron, and then performed a similar experiment by expressing Shibiri temp temperature sensitive in the PAM neurons. Uh, we put the flies in the AGO at, uh, at 29 degrees, and then under starved and fed conditions, we probed them with the 5% acetic acid. Um, in both the genetic controls, we saw this increase in arousal, as we did previously. Um, so under starved conditions, they, they wake more. For acetic acid, whereas the, the, the PAM inhibited flies don't show this increase. So just in summary, um, we in satiated flies, we saw that they're more likely to wake up to aversive odorants. However, the picture changes somewhat when um, flies are starved and they're more likely to wake up to food related odors. It seems that the mushroom body output neurons play a role in um, arousal responses, and um, MB011B plays a role in sleep persistence on odor presentation, because when we inhibit it, we see an increase in arousal. Um, mushroom body output neuron MB011B is upstream of the fan-shaped body, an important sleep center in this forest. And we also um, identified this PAM neuron GMR58EO2 um, in through modulating the activity of the mushroom body output neurons under starved conditions. And this also has a behavioral phenotype in that we see um, increased in arousal to food related odors. Um, so that's pretty much it. I just wanted to thank um, a few people, uh, Giorgio Gillestro, who's my PI and um, who supported me in this work, um, Quentin Geisman and Esteban Beckwith, who are co-authors on this paper and whose, whose contribution were invaluable. 
um, Gillespie Lab members, both past and present, and the Department of Life Sciences at Imperial College London, and of course, the organisers of this wonderful meeting. Thank you very much, and I do apologise for all technical issues at the beginning. <laughs> No problem, Alice, and, and well done on presenting a really beautiful talk um, after going through those troubles, which is never easy. Um, so um, we're open for questions. Um, again, you can, if you're an attendee, you type those in the Q&A, or if you're a panel member, you can either put your hand up or um, uh, put them in the chat. And so I see we do have a question there from David Heckel. David, would you like to ask your question? Can uh, you actually make any recordings from uh, sensory neurons in a sleeping fly or like induce a sleeping state uh, so that you can measure at that level? It's probably the answer is no, but. <laughs> I've not tried. Um, I, it's one thing I'd like to do actually um, to see how actually, like whether the, the, the sort of peripheral sensory neurons are still actually responding to the odorants. I imagine they are. And that this, this sort of gating happens later later in the circuit. Um, so I think that the mushroom body output, uh, sorry, the fan shaped body is this important sleep center. So it, it seems that this modulation is actually occurring before it kind of reaches sort of the sleep center, if you like. Do we have any other questions from our panel members here? I'll just wait a minute. There is, it really is be useful for the next host who has just joined us, Vinant. Um, it's a bit of a delay on the Q&A questions coming in. <laughs> while, while I'm waiting for those, maybe I see that Vinant um, has just joined us. Vinant, would you like to say good morning? <laughs> yes, uh, good morning, or is it a good evening uh, in Australia and uh, Asia? But it's good morning here in Europe and uh, Britain. <laughs> The venue will be taking over shortly. <laughs> All right. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. Yeah, we have a question from uh, Sylvia. From Sylvia? Yes, Sylvia, please. Yeah, I mean, in the same sense as David said, is there any, uh, do you have any idea if there might be some feedback from the, the mushroom body neurons to, to sensory neurons? Is there any way back to, to the input, which might explain if there is a, or not a modulation at the periphery? Mm, I, don't, I don't think there is. We, we've looked at the sort of projection patterns, well, not, not a direct sort of connection, if you see what I mean. We looked at where these um where the mushroom body output neurons are projecting and the fan shaped body was one location but they they typically go to the smp and sort of protocerebral area and this kind of thing so they don't sort of loop back to earlier in the circuit if, if that's if that's what you mean yeah thank you all right thank you okay. thank you alice much appreciated 